it's a privilege to be to be here this morning. I don't know about you, but I am I am extremely grateful that this morning I am not thank you that I'm not only here, but I am here alive and and able to come to this podium to speak and to bring God's word. And let me remind you, it's God's word. It's not my word, it's God's word. So Father, we thank you this morning for bringing us here safely. We thank you for the word. And we thank you for the ability to convey it to the persons, the congregation that is here this morning. We pray the Lord, as it goes out, it will not return void. As your word says, that the word of God stands forever and ever. Amen. This morning, I am going to present to you a version, and I'm saying version because the faithfulness of God is the, the topic, and I know that the faithfulness of God is so broad that another person may come and have a different perspective altogether. But one thing that we can be sure of this morning is that God is indeed faithful. When we look over our lives and we think about the decisions we have made, the good ones we have made, but especially those bad ones, and the fact that we are still here this morning speaks to the faithfulness of God. With those words, I can return to my seat, but I will proceed. So what, what is meant by the faithfulness of God? What is meant by being faithful? And my research tells me that being faithful means remaining loyal to someone or something or to some ideal. It means being steadfast in affection or allegiance. We can have a friend, a faithful friend. That is someone who is always there for us, so thick and thin. Someone who have our back, as we will say. It means to take in a firm stance in adherence to a promise or in observ observance of duty or fulfilling an expectation. Faithfulness implies unrelenting adherence to person or thing or to an oath. And, and we know about the Hippocratic oath that a doctor would take, for example, which is an allegiance to their, their um, profession. Or to an agreement that was made. But we go a little further when we speak of the faithfulness of God. Because what I have described just now relates to the faithfulness of man. But we are going to look at the faithfulness of God, which means that God is unchanging in his nature. He is true to his word. He is true to his promise of salvation of his people. And he will keep those promises forever. He cannot go against his promised word. He is worthy, my friends. He is worthy of eternal trust. No matter how unlikely that promise seems to be. Because sometimes when God makes us promises, and we see this throughout the Bible, we doubt God. We don't believe that God has the ability to bring that promise 
to truism. We don't believe that God has the ability to bring that promise to reality. And we doubt God and we begin to do things on our own. And there we fall into despair. So God is faithful not because we say that God is faithful. But God is faithful because the Bible says that he is. And friends, that Bible that we read, that is the center of our Christianity, if we don't believe it and we don't believe in what is contained in it, we could as well throw it away. So the fact that we continue to read it and continue to believe it implies that we believe the word of God. God is pure. And therefore, his faithfulness is pure and true. God, God cannot, because of his faithfulness, he cannot go against his very nature. He cannot go against his character that is personified and it's exemplified in the Bible. Sometimes, in some moments we have, we call on God. Because in our mind, God is faithful, he'll turn up for us. But sometimes we are wondering, where is God? Where is God when we need him most, we say sometimes. But the Bible, the same very Bible tells us, that even when we believe that he is not close by, he is right here next to us. He is shielding us from even worse situations that we are in. And he is so faithful that even in our valleys, he will remain with us and bring us through. And we can depend on that because of his faithfulness. Now, this does not mean that everything we ask for, every prayer that we pray, that God is going to answer the way we expect him to answer. Because not everything that we pray for is good for us. And because God is an all-knowing God, he knows what is good for us. Friends, the real challenge in our belief in God's faithfulness is when we con continue to experience unanswered prayers. And when the trials of this life, and God knows that there are many, those trials put us to the test. What happens when the beautiful grass is no longer green? Do we remain faithful to our belief? Or do we get discouraged and lose our trust in God? Do we still believe at those moments when things are not going our way that God remains faithful? Now, if we read our Bible carefully, we will realize that God does not promise to give us everything we desire. Instead, as shown in Romans 8.28, he says that he will work all things together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. And God knows, as I mentioned before, what is good for us because he is an all-knowing God. Now, in my research on this topic, I came across a little poem that I thought was apt for this presentation. It was written by John Puckett, and it says, the title is, Why Should I Doubt? And it goes like this. Why should I doubt? Why should I fear? When Jesus, my high priest, is near, would he desert his blood-bought child and let him sink 
in sin defile? Has he not loved and grace combined with power and wisdom sweetly twined? So would he leave me to decay if I neglect sometimes to pray? How much more faithful he than I when sometimes I his name deny? And when my days are filled with cares and few and far between my prayers, why anxious be my child, my love, I rule above and here below. Do you not know that sun and storm and smooth and rough, all good and ill are subject to my will? And I thought that that was a beautiful poem for this topic. It speaks about the faithfulness of God, even when we are not doing what we are supposed to do, even when we are not behaving in the way we are supposed to behave, God does not change his character. He still remains God. So God's character is not dependent on whether you this forgot to pray this morning or not because if he's faithful to you and he promised to bring you here safely he will act on his promise and bring it to reality and that brings me to a little experience i had recently um, as i was driving to work on friday morning me and jan as per usual and there was a song, and she likes to listen to 97.5, which is the gospel station. And there was a song called Too Faithful by Moses Bliss that was being played at that point in time as we wind our way down um, to Kamamir, going through Waterford Bottom. And... The song was sweet, and we began, to, we began to clap and sing along and so on. You know the song, Too Faithful, we are, uh, how it goes, we are, you are too faithful to, to, to fail me, you are too faithful to disappoint me, and so on. A nice song, beautiful song, I like it. And I forgot I was driving. <laughs> As I closed my eyes and I began to clap to this song. <laughs> God woke me up and said, listen, boy, you're driving. And as I woke up from the sweetness of that song, there was a car right ahead of me, and I smashed on the brakes just in time. And I, 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 I told Jan, you see, we were listening to the, a song called Too Faithful. And there's a perfect example of the faithfulness of God. Now, Jan... Um, insists and gives over text to this that we do devotion every night, even when we doubt tired. She has said, Daddy, we gotta do devotions. All right, let me do it. And in that, after devotion, we pray and we ask God, especially to take us to, to school and to work and so on safely. And that is where the faithfulness of God comes in because we ask for God to be faithful to us, to take us safely to our workplace, take us safely to school, and he explained to her at a point in time, there, as we sang that song, God put that example right there for us to see. Amen. Now, the Bible, the, the best known declaration of the faithfulness to God, or one of the best known declarations of the faithfulness to God, must be found in, in Lamentations 3.23, when the prophet Jeremiah boldly declared, great is your faithfulness. In context, it sounded like this, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. That's because he is so merciful, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. That's the truth. God is faithful. 
It is a truth affirmed many times in the Bible. Like in Psalms 36, verse 5. This says, your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the cloud. This scripture speaks of God's faithfulness in noticeably bay terms and rightfully so. God the Father is faithful, church. Jesus Christ is faithful. Of this we can be sure. But there's a question we need to ask. Faithful to what? Deuteronomy 7 verse 9 is immensely helpful in answering this question. It says, therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for thousands of generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. So those are the conditions of his faithfulness. We must love him and keep his commandment. And he is faithful to what? He is faithful to his covenant. To his covenant. Mercy endures forever. God faithfully keeps his promises. Here are some of the promises. The other promises that he made um, according to the covenant. He has, there's the promise of forgiveness of sins. Is found in 1 John verse um, chapter 1, sorry, 1 John um, verse 9, right? Chapter 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, it says, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from, from all our righteousness. God promises sanctification in 1 Thessalonians when he says, now may the good the goodness of God, or the peace of God himself, sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls is faithful, and he will do it. God promises church to sanctify us, to perfect us, and renew us, and to improve us spirit body, and soul. Friends in faith, another good example of, of God's faithfulness is found in the book of Exodus. Remember in Exodus 32, when Moses ascended to Mount Sinai for a meeting with God. On his return from Mount Sinai, after receiving the Ten Commandments, he found that the people had fallen into sin. They had made for themselves a golden calf and were worshipping it instead of the Lord. And you know the Lord is a jealous God. The Lord then told Moses that he was ready to destroy this nation. Because why was he ready to destroy this nation? They were worshipping a God, a calf, which is not really a God, but they were worshiping this God and attributing all of their blessings and their mercies and their deliverance from out of Egypt. They were attributing to this golden calf. Right? So in Exodus, if you look at 9, um, chapter 32, verses 9 through to 14, we get an idea of what God is saying to Israel. God said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, but of you I will make a great nation. But Moses, being a faithful soldier to God and to his people, this is Moses' retort. But Moses sought the favor of God. And he said to God, Why should your anger burn against your people, whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it is with evil intent that you brought them out 
of Egypt to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth. Turn from your face anger, God. Relent and do not bring disaster to your people. Remember your servants Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be in their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented, the Bible said, and did not bring on his people the disaster he has promised. Right? And some of the scholars went on to speak about God changing his mind at this point in time. Let's go a little deeper. Remember this same promise that God is making to Moses at this point in time. He had already made to Abraham. Right? So, if you go to Genesis 12, the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. Sounds familiar? The same promise he's made, he is now making to Moses, he has made to, to, to Abraham. And I will bless you. I will make you, your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Now, if we analyze these situations, for this promise which God made to Abraham before to be fulfilled, God could not have destroyed the people of Israel at that time. Because these are the same people he is promising to make a nation out of. So how could he have destroyed the people at this time? Yet God did not go back on his vow. Because remember the, people, the, the children of Israel were in the wilderness for how long? 40 years. So the, the, the generation to whom God spoke had died by the time they reached the promised land. And the only survivors... For those who, who may want to dig a little deeper in the reading, from that previous generation who were slaves in Egypt would have been Joshua and Caleb according to the word of God. So those children of Israel who complained bitterly about God, you know they complained about the food, the manna, the, they wanted meat, yeah, they wanted water, and God came through. Right? But although he came through on every occasion, they still complained. And they still did not give God his, his just deserts. Right? They still turned from him at every, at the slightest whim, they turned. Right? And we all, we are familiar with the terms God used to describe the people of Israel. All right? So to, to continue... Lamentations speaks to the, the, this faithfulness a little more. But lament, lamentations is an expression, as we know from the word lament, um, expression of grief. And written by the, the, well, thought to be written by the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, lamentations is not only an expression of grief but also an acknowledgement of the cause of Judah's suffering. The people had rebelled, as we mentioned, against God. They refused to heed the warning sent through the prophet Jeremiah. So God afflicted the nation for its sins. The scripture concludes in lamentation that none of what happened was due to God's impulsive anger. God did not get up and say, okay, I'm going to destroy everybody that is here. It clearly states that the Lord has done what he purposed. He has fulfilled his word, which he commanded in the days of old. This is important, an important thought 
leading up to the declaration is that God is faithful. Great is your faithfulness because what God states he's going to do, whether it is good or it is bad, he will do it. So if he promises to bless, he will bless. But similarly, if he promises to destroy because of unbelief and sin, he will destroy because of unbelief and sin. That is his character. And his character is unchanging. That is his nature. Cannot change. So it is for us as Christians to get on the right side of God. We tend to think of, of God's faithfulness in terms of blessings only. Right? When we talk about God being faithful, we talk about the blessings we can receive. We want this, we want the next, and the third. But God has also promised punishment for those who disobey. And he is true to his word. Whether it's a blessing, as I said, or warning. So let us continue, church, to proclaim the blessed truth that God is a faithful God. And let us sing with a loud voice. He has always been faithful to me. Let us remember and be reminded that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. And in Deuteronomy 9 verse, 7 verse 9, sorry, God says, the Bible says that God is faithful, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. In Romans 5, 8, we read that God shows his love for us while we were still, we were still sinners. Christ died for us. God's faithfulness is lovingly de demonstrated through the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross. He remained faithful to his promise of salvation, offering forgiveness, grace, and eternal life to all that trust him. Therefore, church, our God that we serve was and will always be a faithful God. But we too have our part to play. We do not get off scot free. We have our part to play in this quote unquote arrangement. We must be obedient to the everlasting word in order to receive the blessings and the promises of God. So I implore you today. As we reflect on this word, that we bear in mind, one, that God is a faithful God. But in order for us to benefit from his faithfulness, we must love him and keep his commandments. Have a great day. And God, may God bless you abundantly. So, Father, we thank you for the word. We hope there, Lord, we pray and hope that as it went forth, Lord, it touched the hearts and the souls of your people. And that as they go through the week, Lord, that they will reflect on it and it will guide them in their spiritual walk. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.